Welcome to the Africa podcast. My name is Mikey Mahna. Today on this series, I am joined by Leila Sleiman, who is an Egyptian writer and theater director currently between Abu Dhabi and Cairo. Leila, welcome to Afikra. Ahlan. Hello. So, you know, we don't typically have theater directors on the on the series. And, um, you know, when we first started our movie night podcast, we had a lot of uh, directors who direct for film and then realized that there was like kind of a gaping hole in the way we think about storytelling. And that was through our exclusion of the theater. Um, and so hopefully this is the first of many conversations with people who are thinking about storytelling on stage and theatrical productions. So I'm very grateful that you're willing to come on, to, <laughs> on the show. Um, let me ask you just like, you grew up in Egypt, I think. What was your relationship with the theater growing up? Um, I came from an artistic family, so it was part of my journey growing up uh, to be taken to the theater as a child and as someone growing up. Um, and I think at the age of 14, I made the decision that I'd like to be a theater director. And already as a child, I was obsessed with being uh, an actress. Uh, so it's, it's as far as I can remember that I've been very drawn to the theater. And my mother also um, made puppet theater for a part of my childhood. No way. It's, I've always, you know, I grew up knowing about public theater. I didn't really gain to appreciate it, have a full appreciation about it. Can you just explain to people listening who don't know anything about this, maybe including me, um, a little bit about the legacy of public, public puppet theater in the region? Because there is a long, very important legacy. I mean, in terms of when we talk about the history of theater, um, the history of theater as we know it in the region, uh, of course, if you exclude pharaonic um, temple rituals, would be starting with the Hakawaiti or the storyteller, as well as uh, the traditional shadow puppet theater, as well as the traditional Aragos, uh, which is a hand glove puppet. Uh, which of course had its own siblings all over the region, the Karakuzi in Turkey and uh, and in Greece, but also, I mean, what you would refer to as Punch and Judy uh, in the West. And then sort of at the end of the 19th century started these ambitions, at least as I know them from the Egyptian history of theater to have a Paris on the Nile and to import opera and first import theater from France or companies, but then also to start translating famous plays and start producing them um, in Egypt before having um, our own kind of written performances. And of course, many of the performers were from Iraq and the Levant, but residing in Egypt. Did yeah. I answer your question? You totally answered it. When you talk about puppets, just for a second, are you talking uh, shadow puppets? So when I was talking about puppets, for example, in the example of my mother, they were yeah. more, she worked with hand glove puppets and made mm -hmm. them as well as um, marionettes, so string puppets. Yeah. And she had also some experiments in shadow puppets. That's in terms of my mother. But when I'm talking about puppets, it's all of the above. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you have this interesting vantage point as, uh, both a practitioner, somebody who's working in the theater, somebody who studied at American university of Cairo, somebody who studied in Europe and Holland and somebody who's teaching now at a university in the region at NYU Abu Dhabi. I'm curious, how was theater taught in the region? Um, compared to maybe other places and compared to how it's actually practiced in the industry? 
Well, I have to admit that my experiences of studying and teaching in the regions have been in foreign institutions. I mean, whether it's the American University in Cairo or um, or New York University, they do not compare, of course, to the experience of someone who might be have studied in Damascus and the conservatory or in Egypt um, and or in, I mean, Lebanon has, I mean, I, I, I would say, yeah, or Lebanon, the national university or compared yeah. to the Yasuaia, which is linked to the French system or the LAU or AUB. Um, so I think there are attempts like all over the world in the global south for foreign institution to attempt decolonization or rethinking of curricula to not be western centric but i have to admit as as an industry and a lot i mean that's currently a challenge for most art education it is western centric in terms of the theories at least yeah um so i think there is an attempt to rethink curriculums but we are far from it and so i don't think the education is that different as such in the region from outside the region i mean i have to admit that as a theater maker i've often seen works of colleagues from the region more actually in europe than in the region itself because of our yeah. political systems, production systems, uh, and so on. Yeah, it's almost like there is this thing where so much of the the cultural discourse in inside the Arab world is is focused on decolonization, right? Um, and then you see the end credits of some of these productions, and they're all <laughs> they're all these, um, you know foreign European uh, North American um, cultural funds. And so there's this like uh, dichotomy um, that's that's hard to hard to ignore. It's staring you in the face. Um, I think it depends where you are, of course, because I mean, if you yeah. look at places like uh, the UAE, um, it has a small production scope, but it but it still has its own sort of production funds like the Sharjah Art Foundation and so on. Yeah. So I think it really depends where you're looking at in the region and what the political situation is. And uh, that very much influences the production mechanism. Yeah. So there's this term that I feel like I have seen come up in your work, uh, maybe in some of the descriptions of the work, this idea of like alternative history um, and uh, have retelling stories um, of our past in powerful ways and giving voice to people who didn't typically have the mic. Um, do you feel like that's part of your um your reason for writing writing the plays that you do write the and making the theater that you make? I find it a bit arrogant, like I can't claim to give voice. I find that term a bit arrogant, but I, uh, I have to say that I'm drawn to what is considered the margin or the marginalized. And um, I think also it's difficult to use the word alternative without using the word uh, nationalistic narratives or because uh, I think that's the issue of the alternative. It's just not an alternative in general, but the it's an alternative to having one narrative. So it's it's actually an alternative to defend the multiplicity of narratives rather than the way we learn at school that there is only one existing narrative and usually one leader uh, and so on yeah so yeah so essentially the idea is that okay somebody like me comes in right 
and I say, oh, wow, this is an alternative view. What, let me just say back to you what I think you just said to me is, it's not that this is an alternative one, the alternative view, this is one of many alternative views. And what you're trying to suggest is that there's a, um, it's not a binary, it's not a duality, but there's this multiplicity of views. And this is just one of many um, that may, should be considered. And that fundamentally is something that I or somebody like me would misunderstand. I think that the main topic, I mean, you're right about that, but also the main topic is to to sort of negate the the narratives that currently in most of the region stand alone as the only narrative. Okay. So whether it's two or 10 or five, but at least, I mean, that's why when I was saying that when we use the word alternative, we have to also say alternative to what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we use it? Can, let's let's use an example. Let's take your your play Zigzag, which I have not have had the benefit of uh, being able to watch. Um, so this came out in 2015. This was produced in 2015, um, and I'd be very curious to understand how maybe that concept that we're talking about may apply to this. So Zigzag came out in 2016, and. Um, it's more of that it's a part of history that is not known. Uh, I don't think so. It's it's less of contradicting something that exists, but shedding a light on something that doesn't exist. And when shedding a light on it, so many questions came up. So giving these questions space, so to say, that was the main purpose of that. So we found by coincidence these documents um, dating back to 1919, where a group of women had gone to testify uh, in the Mudereya, saying that they were raped and assaulted by British soldiers, and then the investigations that came out of that um, sort of uh, claim. Um, they were m military investigations mainly and I think what was very confusing about this part is, first of all, it breaks our view of what is um, expected of rural versus city women, of what is emancipation, when did it happen, um, and so on. But also it, it, it brought the question of whether these women did that because that was a planned sort of um, instrumentalization uh, of them in the nationalist movement, or was that sort of a genuine uproar for their rights? And yeah. whether also, I mean, and how far, when was it that this story was sort of making news? And when was it that this story was like sort of pushed aside, uh, which happens often with news, I mean, even nowadays. Uh, and I think all these questions opened also questions and comparisons of us women nowadays reading these files on um, events that we had lived through of uh, mass violence against women on the streets. Just for context, you said 1919 British uh, soldiers. Where, what was the context? I mean, wh where was this taking place? So the investigations and these women were um, in Giza, in a village in Giza, um, but which looked less urban than today, which was very much mm -hmm. countryside. Uh, along the lines of the railway. Uh, so, and I think the main issue was, I mean, we came across these documents when we were looking at the effects of World War I on Egypt and Egyptians and what stayed in the collective memory and questioning why it stayed. Um, 
So, and everybody knows that in Egypt and in India and in several other places, after these countries had supported the British during World War I, they thought they deserved independence for their um, sacrifices, supporting the kingdom. And so they made a case to present uh, in 1919 their case in a peace conference in Paris to ask for their independence. Uh, so this was kind of the overall theme. And then we discovered uh, these incidents that happened. And then an incident like this was, for example, included in the folder that was presented in the request for independence. So you wonder then in how far was the uncovering of such uh events had it not been needed for uh this file yeah. would they have been unearthed or would the woman have been women have been uh sort of encouraged to uh to testify and so on or not yeah when they, when they aren't um useful would they have been discarded? Yeah. Especially that we know like that rape is often linked to honor. Yeah. And even nowadays, I mean, there is a lot of statistics and studies about how difficult it is for women all over the world to go and testify. Where did this premiere? In Cairo. What is the response? I mean, this is a, a conversation about collective memory. It's a conversation about understanding impact. It's a, sadly, it is a timely subject matter, even though it's a hundred years old. Um, what was the response? I mean, beautiful. Um, it was really, uh, beautiful to engage in the conversations and to have the reactions. And this is, I think, one of my widest touring pieces uh, that I've had in my 20 year career. Yeah. Does it does it play differently in different places? Uh, I think at some point we had a change in cast and that changed certain things in the performance uh rather than the places i think the focus becomes often when you tour performances that are very linked to your own uh, politics or context the gaze becomes different and there are different points of interpretation or focus but i don't think it played differently it was viewed differently probably mm. yeah I think there was so much subtext that you would get as an Egyptian or an Arab who um, has witnessed or has been interested in, in contemporary events um, than, let's say, uh, an average European looking at it, for example. It's interesting, this, this moment in time at the beginning of the 20th century, um, when there is this uh flavor in the air of uh independence and revolution um does that actually do you feel like that is part of the daily collective memory of of egyptians or at least your community of egyptians because it's something you've explored right across a couple of different pieces i think the narratives that we were fed uh, are very specific. So what stayed for us are very specific songs like of Said Darwish uh, and also this idea of Saad Zaghloul as a leader. Whereas when, when we look deeper into it, it was very 
different like the 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 overall story was a bit different and i have to thank alia musallam the cultural historian for really um guiding me through that journey of looking into that period and into the archives i think it also depends on your personal background growing up so if i um i remember i was very obsessed with 1968 to 1972 and the protest movements that happened then someone else because they would grow up in a Nasser, Nasseri family would very much be you know like very much uh, getting the narrative of the revolution of 1953 uh, so I think it very much depends on your generation, but also what kind of household you grew up in, uh, what are your political affiliations or none, uh, for you to like really be more concerned with one period over another. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's interesting how that may, those, uh, those memories get retold. And, you know, like we don't have memories, we have like memories of memories, you know, so how that latest iteration shifts over time, um, because <laughs> they become less or more useful, um, uh, to us. Um, I okay. think it's been also very interesting to see, especially in the, I mean, for us as Egyptians looking at. And I think this similar things happened in Iraq, Yemen, Syria, to look at uh, school mm -hmm. curric curricula uh, yeah. and how they've changed their focuses, how they've changed what, what parts of history they're telling and which parts they are not and how they were, how they are making links. Because I mean, as we discovered also this narrative that Saad Zaghloul was the only leader was a story that was very much um, kind of reinforced during Nasser's time. And again, now we are also reinforcing these uh, stories of the ultimate leaders. Yeah. I mean, in general, like beware of simple stories. Let's, let's skip to now and then we'll go back to some of your other works. What are you working on now? Uh, I'm currently working on a performance um, type, I mean, with the working title, the story of and in brackets, infertility, um, which is looking at women's experiences with IVF and um, the language of belly dance. Um, as well as um, I'm very happy to be able in uh, New York University to work on sort of curating a very multidisciplinary program between intellectual and artistic and academic interventions on questions and complexities of motherhood titled on motherhood and its shadows. So for somebody who's listening to this, right. And they're outside the art world entirely. Like they're, a, they're a dentist, right. <laughs> when you talk about like multidisciplinary, um, you know, I have on the screen now, uh, a screenshot of the open call for this, um, this series. And it says a multidisciplinary kaleidoscope of events. Um, can you help somebody understand what that sort of means when it's in relation to this theme of on motherhood and its shadows? I mean, we use the word kaleidoscope because it's hardly used because it doesn't exist almost because we were trying <laughs> to find a word that uh, works as a metaphor for what we're trying to do, but also works for artists as well as academics, because there are certain words like workshop, for example, who have different, which have different meanings. Uh, in the art world versus the academic world, since this is a university. And when we say multidisciplinary, also it's, it's multidisciplinary in terms of sciences. So someone might be, so we have neuroscientists, we have doctors giving pre 
panels, but also we have mothers talking about personal narratives. We have um, economists talking about the economy of working mothers or uh, political scientists or historians addressing a certain event in history at a certain point. Um, but also workshops that are interactive for people to participate in and create their own works or also artistic interventions of hopefully concerts or performances or exhibitions that people can just enjoy. So it's also it's a word that we try to use to make it open to everyone. Yeah. So everyone can find something in it, having been either uh, a daughter or a son or a mother. Uh, yeah. Leila, do you feel like your work is for everyone? I think there is always the ambition that everyone can take something from it. It doesn't mean that everyone will view it or have the same take out of it. Um, talking about, for example, people from different contexts, if they watch the same work, but also people with different backgrounds or different kinds of education or different levels of exposure to art. But I definitely, I think, do an effort to make sure that everyone can find something in it or have uh, an entry point yeah. in some way. I'm not very much interested to create work that doesn't at all communicate or when like is conceptually inaccessible. Yeah, it's tr it's interesting because theater is is this medium that you, or you have to be in the house. You have to be there, right? You're not, it's not a broadcast medium. It's um, a live production that is like as narrow cast as possible, <laughs> right? It's like for the people in the house at that moment, it's ephemeral and you hear the sound waves coming out of the people's lungs. Um, and so it, it, in some ways it can't be for everyone because it, there's only so many seats in the house um, and and it's not broadcast forever obviously unlike a like a, a tv show or a record that's recorded um and so for that in that way it does suggest an exclusionary aspect that's structural that has to do with just the fact that the, the nature of <laughs> time and place but it's hard to, I wonder how you try to circle that square, how you try to say, okay, I want to reach as many, or maybe you don't want to reach as many people, but I want to reach the people who do enter the place. I don't want this place to be inaccessible. Um, but yet it is. So it's, it's a tricky thing. And it's, it's true of all live performances, but I wonder how you think about that. I mean, I think you're right about the medium and uh, numbers. And I don't think I've done the best job or been as keen to reach as many people as possible. I think what's important to me is that what kind of experience the people in the room have. I think the other thing about accessibility is that from my point of view is changing who is on stage or focusing on who is on stage really affects also your audiences as well as the topics you're tackling so sometimes you'll reach a different kind of audience because there's someone who's not usually on stage on stage or also because of what topic you're tackling so i think that's been um something I've been keen on. I think also some of the works have been very different. Some have been inside specific places. Some have been um, completely open to passers-by. Some have been um, having online formats like during COVID. So I think the, I mean, these questions are very valid. Um, 
I, the reason why I don't think I personally attempted to have as many audiences as possible f has been more about uh, institutional or production support mm -hmm. uh, as a more self-producing artist, at least in the earlier parts of my career um, and later someone who's working less in Egypt for, I mean, known reasons. Um, I think that's been a challenge. Um, and I don't, and I think my priorities have been more my freedom <laughs> or the freedom of choice of topics and what to say and how to say it rather than reaching everyone. Uh, which I might regret or think differently about in my older days. <laughs> but I think until now, it, uh, it, it hasn't been very combinable to reach as many audiences as possible and say what you say, want to say in the way you want to say it or raise the questions you want to raise in the way you want to raise them or address the topics you want to address. Yeah. The bigger the boxes that you stand on, the more you can get shot. <laughs> yeah. Is that hard? Uh, I didn't always feel it was hard. I mean, I was always very satisfied with my choices. And I think life has been generous to me. I think at this stage of being a mid-career artist, it's starting to be hard, um, but it hadn't been until now. But now it, it is starting to continue and I am at this stage where, I mean, I'm currently working on my archive and um, working on a book, um, kind of documenting the 20 years of practice and the works, because as you said, it's a very ephemeral medium so how yeah. to kind of document it in a tangible way that doesn't disappear. Um, and it is a moment where I am questioning how to continue or looking at it like a really, yeah, like uh, an intersection of roads. It strikes me as an emotional decision to like a heavy decision because the nature of like, casting broadly means that maybe you have to water down what you're saying. I think some people are capable of that and some people are not. So that's not the decision I'm looking at. But I think that the main decision is, as you said, like often as independent artists in the region, You've had to uh, rely heavily on foreign funding or uh, on partnering with um, institutions elsewhere. And I think also the global map after COVID and um, certain awareness of climate issues, the, the, the global map of funding is really changing. And so for people like me, it becomes also, it, it raises a lot of questions on how to continue. Yeah. Was there ever a golden age for theater production in the Arab world? I don't know if we can speak about the Arab world as a total. I know, for sure. example, in Egypt, I'd say definitely the 60s. I mean, it was a golden age for culture in general. I mean, the amount of budget, the priorities, who was involved in creating the cultural map of the government uh, and so on. I mean, uh, but I don't know if you can sort of generalize uh, about the golden age of the, I think if you look at, Iraq or Syria or um, at, at each of those, again, tied up to the political climate, 
you'll find a golden age for each of them in their histories. But I, I think it's difficult to, yeah, to generalize on that. Okay, so I want to theorize how and when and why these golden ages of cultural production, let's use theater just as a case study, can emerge. Is it always tied to large scale funding? Like if there's just large scale financial support for cultural practitioners and producers, then it's easy. Then the <laughs> the golden age begins and the minute it dries up or the minute there is I mean, I think I think the word golden age is already we'll have to go back to defining it. If we're talking sure. about scale of productions or like, OK, like, for example, now often people talk about are we talking about how many films this year produced in a certain country got awards or are we talking how many films were produced in this year uh, or how many individuals went into bought a, a cinema ticket. I mean, these are very different things. Let's say I now shifted to film, for example. Sure. And I think the same thing is for golden age. Are we describing often, of course, if you want larger scale, then the, the production is linked to a government because it in in a it is going to be to be put bluntly, the biggest institution, the biggest institution who's not keen on financial profit. I think that's how I would define, because, of course, we have also the golden age of commercial theater, which is a completely different time and different scale and different priorities. Yeah. Um, which is not necessarily what I personally am not I'm interested in. Uh, so I think, yeah, I, I think golden age is a tricky word. Are we talking about scale? Are we talking about freedom? Are we talking about um, creative buzz? Uh, yeah. Because often also, I mean, all of these underground scenes, there are golden also ages that are in underground scenes, but then they are small scale and yeah. and what is the yeah so i think we, you have to define what what's your priority when defining sure. a golden age yeah i mean it's definitely like uh in the eye of the beholder so there's there isn't a right answer but it's uh like if you ask me about the golden age of something i care about like i don't know uh hip-hop right i'll have a different answer compared to somebody else um, but it, it does reflect, it tells you more about me than it does about hip hop. <laughs> I think, I think it's, it, for me, it's a mixture between, um, uh, artists creating what they want to create with, uh, honesty or integrity. And at the same time in a climate of freedom. Uh, to make sure that it reaches audiences and at the same yeah. time also is accessible. So it doesn't depend on how much can you pay and hence, can you see it or not? Yeah. Can I ask you a simple question about what it means to be an artist? Do you feel like you have a choice to become an artist or not? Or it's like it was in your DNA. You don't have a choice. It was made for you. Uh, I mean, since I'm at the moment of existential crisis. <laughs> yeah, this is a perfect time to ask you. <laughs> I think growing up, I didn't feel a choice because this is what I was most drawn in. I remember when I was choosing what to study at the moment, it was either theater or law. Uh, but because of this passion for like looking for justice or fighting for justice and the means to do so. Um, I think at different moments, I mean, I even put these questions in a work that was called No Time for Art. Uh, during the revolution, there is this question of 
when is it about being useful or not, or um, especially in moments of violence or so on, and how to address them or process them. Um, I mean, I'm personally teaching at NYU at a moment where I'm questioning after 20 years of working as a freelance artist, um, how to continue to just be a freelance artist or to combine it with an educational path to pass on knowledge. Also, the pass on knowledge is a private institution, the best place to pass on knowledge or also other formats of teaching, which I've done before, like workshops in underprivileged areas or so I think there is no. Uh, I personally am on the search. I, I mean, no. I can't. Uh, I don't have a clear answer, and especially in this world, part of the world where we don't have institutional support. So, for example, like in my case, what if you have an, a health issue? Like, how do you continue as a freelance artist or how do you continue as a, an individual or how do you make sure that 20 years of work will not disappear or uh, will be will stay somehow beneficial to someone uh, and to make sure that I mean this also this question of what is a collective and what is a individual effort uh, in this process of art making and I think these are very valid questions and of course especially for I mean, whether you consider yourself an artist or not, or but people in precarious professions, um, I mean, especially in this part of the world where we don't have the same state support of having um, insurances or, or the state to fall on to you keep thinking of how it, at each step, how to continue. Yeah. You know, everything, theater in, in particular is an extremely collaborative exercise, you know, um, theater making. It's funny that you like even talk about this idea of like doing things on your own versus being part of a collective. And it makes me wonder how... <laughs> for lack of a better word, how lonely the work that you're doing is. I think when I meant here collective, I didn't mean as collective as in with collaborators. I think I've been very blessed with partners and collaborators in those 20 years. Um, I think it's more of when I talk of uh, individual versus collective, it's more of an institutional approach. And I see it even in the region, like artists who have managed to stay, like sort of a, with their name or people who became like a brand or an institution. And then that institution grows to support them. And these are the three different models in a way uh, that are very much, or if you pair up with like, let's say a visual artist, do you have a gallery or an agent or do you, did you create a design brand to support your artistic practice with a commercial way or so all of these kind of mechanisms are more what I mean with individual versus collective efforts rather than um, a collective versus an individual. I think, yeah, I don't know if it's if it's. Um, as lonely or I feel it that way just because of where I am uh, in my career in terms of decision making and what choices I've made like and how far when you stay based in a city in Cairo versus let's say moving to Berlin uh, what access will you have or uh, or if you stay in Cairo versus coming to Abu Dhabi or moving to New York I mean I think I think most 
artists in the region face these questions because you know you will have much more access to international audiences in different parts of the world. Yeah. It's tough. It's super tough. Um, I get it. Uh, I really do. Um, I want to ask you about two other projects in particular. I like wrote down, I really want to ask you about them. Um, so if you don't mind, can we switch subjects real quick? Sure. <laughs> got a bit gloomy. <laughs> no, no, I think it, it got real. I got real. We can come back to it in a second. But um, I want to talk about one of, interestingly enough, one of your collaborative projects, uh, Le Grande Maison, um, because it's about an interesting subject matter that I knew nothing about as somebody who's never been to Tunis. So if you can, can you just describe what it's, you know, one about the collaboration, two about this famous street, um, and three, you know, what is this uh, piece of work about? So this piece of work is about uh, the history of uh, the street, Abdel Lagish. Uh, in Tunis, as well as the question of decriminalization of sex work, which is a question all over the world in terms of how useful or efficient it is or who it supports. Um, but in Tunis, in that area, is the last area in the Arab and Islamic world uh, that decriminalizes sex work. Uh, and especially after the revolution, and at the time Nahda was in power, there was very much the question of whether this will continue or whether it will be uh, abolished, like the decriminalization of sex work in Tunisia. So at that moment, it felt like a necessity to document very much, to analyze, um, but also because I think uh, sex work is, a, is an interesting intersection in terms of this relationship between the state or authority and the human body, uh, in terms of how it, uh, you can see kind of the weaknesses of health systems, you can see um yeah it's really like you can see in its crudest form this relationship between the human body and uh, and the state or power uh yeah. in a way and um it was also important for us to try to tackle it in a in a in an inclusive manner in relation to gender um but also to highlight some of the issues which had to do with who's allowed to be a woman and who's allowed to be a man uh, in that system of, of like decriminalization. Um, and the question of who's cashing most of the money at the end, even if it's organized by the state. Yeah. So the photos are of... Um, the installation, which was uh, very much a, a re kind of re uh, remodeling after a real house, um, and you see the screens had video interviews with the women, uh, but also, I mean, we wanted very much to address who is in service of that profession. So, and also to amplify the issues of labor. So in the installations, there were the people who stand guard at the door, the people who clean, um, the people who organize the entrance rather than the sex workers themselves. Can I ask you, what about this project surprised you before, as you were working on it? I think a lot of things. I also didn't know about the decriminalization as such in Tunisia. I've been, I'm someone who's been very uh, interested on in this question of criminalization, decriminalization, um, 
and the formats in which six industries all over the world function uh, in their legality. And I've always been very interested in relationship between the history of belly dance and the history of prostitution. I mean, when you say talk about it historically in the Arab world, and especially in Egypt. So I was very surprised and um, yeah, I mean, it was amazing that I'm one of the few women who managed to enter. I mean, it's very uncommon for a woman to get access into that area. Um, and the other thing I think that was difficult was at some point the the process got very complex in the working and until now we cannot identify I mean it'll remain a mystery but what made it difficult was it that certain people were not like certain people were not happy that we were working on the topic and it never became clear of who was unhappy yeah and i think uh that at some point was beyond my expectations uh, and we had to constantly rethink the topic to stay the, to rethink the form and the artistic concept and to find a way to stay true to it uh although the parameters and the boundaries were changing in a way that we couldn't even totally grasp. Yeah. Um, and to find ways for still to represent, you know, the women in a way that we felt right. Interesting. Yeah. Super, super um, interesting subject matter. Um, before we wrap up, I really want to talk about one project that um, actually is what, um, originally I was, was the thing that I was first, that first drew me to you, which is an opera that you worked on, um, women at point zero based by the, the novel by Nawal, uh, Nawal al Sadawi. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this project came to be, um, your relationship with the, with the novel beforehand and what what your relationship with the work is now uh so actually it was the composer bushra al-turk who decided mm -hmm. to work on the uh, novel uh uh point zero by noel sadawi and uh, she with a production company a belgian a musical theater production company called lod approached me to work together um and i have to say i've always been intrigued by opera and keen to direct my first um because of this ability of music and the human voice to condense and express emotions um and of course also a contemporary opera so so not creating something that's historical or not but rather really collaborating eye to eye with another artist um, in their form. Um, and I was really interested to combine that novel with documentary material from nowadays in Egypt, because the novel was written in 1978. And also to see how Noel Sadewi's feminist perspective from 1978 can be brought to stage nowadays with in a way that also agrees with our current feminist perspective at least on the part of the team involved so i'm very happy uh, with all the collaborators i had bisena sharif on video and set uh, stacy hardy who wrote the uh, libretto a south african poet and um of course, Bushra is the composer and the singer, especially Dima Orsho, was uh, unbelievably inspiring to work on in the process. Um, uh, the tour is 
the the opera is still hopefully on tour for a while because operas are very expensive and slow <laughs> uh, as a touring process they're not like plays where you and also musicians and singers and someone as amazing as the Japanese conductor Kanako Abe is uh, you have to book ahead <laughs> so yeah. it's a it's a different touring process definitely uh, than other works I've had um, I'm currently not touring with the piece it's touring on its own whenever possible uh, but we're still very proud and happy. I mean, last summer it was in the Royal Opera House in London, uh, as well as uh, the Opera of Rena Sofia in Valencia. So very prestigious places. Uh, so definitely grateful to life, especially that it was a project that was a COVID project, which took several years. Uh, yeah. of postponing and changing and being stuck in countries because there were lockdowns and all of these kinds of stories to make it happen. Amazing. Okay, um, Leila, I'm going to ask you one final question. Um, let's say a student comes up to you and says, Leila, I love your plays. I love everything that you've worked on. But who are your, you know, your inspirations? Who is the sort of the your uh, top five, so to speak, in in the worlds of rap? Top five that are live um, theater makers that you think totally inspire the way you do your work and um, make you enjoy the medium. Living or living and dead. Living and dead. Top five theater makers living and dead. So actually, I'm laughing because. Students did ask me that question last week, <laughs> and I totally uh, kind of ran away from the answer. Um, I, I'll, I'll say the names that come quickest to my mind. It might, doesn't mean that they're the most important, and it doesn't mean that there's no one else. But I would say uh, a professor who passed away, Mahmoud al -Lozi. Uh, who taught me. I would also say that when there are directors in the region, in their way of working that have been very inspiring to me, such as Hassan Gritli, Ruj Yassif, uh, Ahmed Latar, who's only one generation older than me, uh, Omar Bukhalid, um and also, of course, several people in Syria. Uh, I mean, I can mention many more. And then someone in terms of, for example, opera directing and feminist opera directing, I would definitely say Katie Mitchell. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> I could go on in a endless list. And I would also say definitely in terms of discipline and these questions about integrity definitely my father hasn't seen me amazing um so if anyone is interested in learning more um leila can be found on her contact information on the nyu obw website as well as on social media you can see all the trailers uh or little snippets from some of her work on her youtube page um, Leila, thanks so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it, especially during a moment of existential angst. Thank you for reaching out and inviting yeah. me. Akil. I'm a fan of Africa anyway. <laughs> <laughs>